Hi, this is Marnie Pearson and Sue Painter back with the Online Business Reality Show or Marnie and Sue's Peep Show where we pull back the curtains on our lives and businesses and give you kind of the behind the scenes look. So, hey Sue, how you doing? I'm good. How are you doing, Marnie? Doing well. How's the wedding plans coming? Coming along great. Everything's popping along. I, I think I've picked a man who's as get it done as I am. So <laughs> That's a good match then. Get it done, get it done. Yeah, it is. So he's more on the ball than I am, I think, on that. So <laughs> awesome. Yeah. It's good to have that match because if you have somebody who like lags behind, then the other person always feels like they're like pull in the rope. You know? And that gets yeah. to be old after a while, I would imagine. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> so today, Marnie and I thought that we might talk about a couple of different things. One of them being <laughs> a phrase that I just coined when we were before we went live which is the entrepreneurial horizon <laughs> is a fancy way of saying we both are looking at each other and saying for us and our businesses the entrepreneurial year is over it's now starting it's time to start thinking about what you're going to be doing next year because this year is almost stick a fork in it you're done <laughs> It's all, you already probably have every all your launches, all your business travel, everything planned out from now to the end of the year. So Marnie, tell me a little bit about your entrepreneurial horizon. Are you also feeling like, like I woke up this morning and I sat down to do my work and I was like, it's over. I mean, I see now the, ne the next four months are here is what I'm going to be doing and it's over. I need to start planning stuff for next year, like already now, which I normally start doing that over the July the 4th weekend anyway. Oh, well, you're a little more uh, prepared than I am, but I have um, this last little window here between now and right around Thanksgiving, before yeah. Thanksgiving, is where you can make some good cash flow. It's yeah. a good time because everybody's thinking back to school. They think education, go get out and um, learn some new thing. The challenge is that most people, if they wait that long to learn how to do something like create an income, they're learning it while they should have been marketing it. And it's going to happen next uh, year. Yeah. Right. Here's the entrepreneurial horizon. Exactly. <laughs> right. So I, I'm pushing right now my product creation program because I at least helped you get it done fast where you could get something done. It probably wouldn't be some monster program, but at least some kind of revenue, revenue generating thing within a week or two. And you could take advantage of that. Yep. window. So yep. that's what I'm pushing because I'm realizing, Hey, most people would never be able to pull it off on their own. Um, but if they could do it now with let me help them, they could get something, making some money. And then this last little quarter, right. Which get dedicated by, I mean, I actually resist and don't like that. Everybody is talking about summer is over. I must have seen that a thousand times on Facebook today because everybody's posting pictures of their kids first day back at school, which for many school systems is today. And I'm like, hello, it's the 10th of August. It's hotter than hell here. It's going to be hotter than hell here for another six weeks. Sorry, it's not over. But when kids go back to school, the society and the culture automatically starts turning to fall. And you're right. We have a little window before the holidays hit. And then once the holidays hit, it's over till the end of the year, right? So really, um, for your entrepreneurial mindset, this is the time, this is the last shot you have this year to make offers and to pull money in the door because things are probably going to shut down and get pretty slow. Now you can be working on next year's stuff, but you're not going to probably successfully launch something from the Monday before, th or actually the weekend before Thanksgiving all the way till New Year's. You can do a couple of free little webinars in there, maybe in early December and try to push something out toward the first of the year. But do you agree with me, Marnie? Pretty much the calendar year for us is over like the weekend before Thanksgiving. Yeah. Do you agree or no? Yeah, I agree. Unless you're selling some product that people buy for Christmas presents. But, right. You know. Yeah, I agree. So, so it really is a nice little window of opportunity. And, and I'm glad to hear you're thinking about ways to, and making offers to people to help them see what they could quickly monetize at least a little bit to get some income flow in this really kind of launchy part of the year. Cause spring and fall kind of seem to be the launchy times in the online world. 
Yeah. Uh, and I'm kind of doing the same thing. On Wednesday this week is my webinar about how to boost your blog, your blog visibility using visual content marketing. And if you, if nobody, if you haven't signed up for that yet and you're interested to sign up, you can go to confidentmarketer.com slash blog visibility. And I'm going to be teaching that on Wednesday. Um, and then I will also be offering as at the end of that webinar, a 30 day challenge that will help you push blog visibility for the whole entire time between the 17th of August to the 17th of September. And I'll teach you structured how to do that. So that'll be coming up. So you can, you're welcome to listen into the webinar. There's no charge for it. And you do get the worksheet that my team actually uses to push out blog visibility for every single blog post we do. Every single one across all the websites, we use this worksheet. And I'm, I'm giving you a copy of that actual worksheet as a part of the webinar. So if you want to come, you're welcome to be there. Um, but yeah, this whole horizon thing, I mean, Barney was asking me, well, what am I up to? And I'm thinking, well, in September, you know, I've got a trip down to Florida for a week. In October, I've got to go to Scottsdale for an alley event. In November, I've got to go to LA for two different events that are back to back. By the time I get back from that, it's going to be the holidays. And not travel isn't taking up my entire life, but I've got client work and alley work in between there. So I'm like, yeah, the end of the year is like right here in my sight. I mean, I know what I'm going to be doing pretty much between now and the holiday season. And that's how it works for entrepreneurs. You always have to be thinking, um, you have to be a horizon thinker, which is why I like that term entrepreneurial horizon. You have to be a horizon thinker. You have to be thinking about what is it you want to be doing six months from now and then laying the groundwork now. Do you see that in your clients where they don't understand how to process and get to where they want to go? They don't understand what to put, what to do first, second, and third to get to an objective? Totally. Yeah. And what, why is that, do you think? I think it's because most of my clients are, um, they're more big picture people, you know, they are the dreamers and, and that kind of thing. But to take and implement that and break it down into steps and details is really hard for them to do. It's just the way their brains work, I think. Mm -hmm. I think part of that is an entrepreneurial mindset. I think entrepreneurs, we're idea people. You know, we, we see that big picture of where things could go. And then some of us are implementers, like Joy Chudikoff, my buddy who also coaches for Allie. Joy is a great implementer. We can have a conversation about, well, she thinks she's going to do this, this, and this. And in a week, I swear, she's got her entire list done. And then there are other people who... I'm more creative. I like to spin the ideas and then I, I'm like, I'm a delegator. I want to hand it off and you do this, you do this, you do this, and then it all gets done. Mm -hmm. So we have different styles of working in that way, but you do have to find a way to implement what it is that you're dreaming up. Otherwise you're a dreamer. You're not a business owner and you're never monetizing anything. You just want to sit around and spin ideas and talk is cheap, but it doesn't fatten your bank account. <laughs> it doesn't pay your bills. So that's true. That's true. You've got to implement, either do it yourself or you've got to be willing to delegate. And I think a lot of people that are not willing to spend the money to delegate. And so it just right. happen. That's yeah. an interesting energy though, because it, it kind of gets into that control freak energy. Um, so people say, I'm a control freak. I can't stand to delegate it. Well, then you're never going to be successful in business because you can't possibly do it all yourself in the online world. Let me just tell you that's number one. Number two, it takes money to make money. So you've got to be able to hire a little bit of help, especially if it's something that you're resisting and you keep procrastinating and put it off. If you're procrastinating and you've put it off, if you're going to do a, a webinar and you're going to charge $47 for that class, let's say, and you never get around to doing that webinar, but you refuse or to setting that up, to setting up the sales page, you never get around to it. You just can't be bothered. You keep putting it off and procrastinating and you could hire somebody to set that sales page up to you for let's say 200 bucks. Well, all you have to do is sell four seats to that webinar to have paid for that 200 bucks. My point is delegate it if you're going to refuse to do it, because guess what? If you refuse to do it, it's always going to be the big goose egg. 
But if you get the sales page up, which you can recycle and use again and again and again, and you sell, let's say, even 10 seats at $47, that's $470 minus 200 to pay somebody to set up the sales page is 270 profit. That's not a whole heck of a lot of profit, but guess what? It's $270 better than this, which is what you've got when you keep procrastinating. <laughs> Right. Plus, like you said, it's set up for the next time and the next time and the next time. You just yeah. yeah. And you can model it and change the topic. And so you've got your framework. So if you really don't know how to do it, then that's the cool thing. So. <sighs> hmm. I have a question for you. Okay. What do you do when somebody comes to you and they want to buy one of your programs, but they don't have the money for it, and they'll say, "Well, would you sell it to me for X?" And they they kind of haggle with you. What do you What do you do? Hang up the phone. On <laughs> 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 email. <laughs> I would look at it a couple of different ways. First of all, um, you know. If they can't afford to buy the whole thing, it depends on the, it, honestly, it depends on the price point. What would be the price point, let's say? Um, like a high end thing or a $47 thing, or what are we talking here? High end thing. Like, well, not high, but moderate. Let's say a $600 program and they want to pay half. Oh, why would you discount your work and the transformation that you're giving that person to half? If you discount it, they're going to discount it as well. So if they want it, they'll find a way. Here's my deal about that. It's never about the money. Never about the money. It's about the fact that they do not yet see the transformation and the good that it's going to do them. So I would be having a conversation about what is this going to do for you and what's going to happen if you don't do it. And then that's your choice. Now, I might offer them a payment plan. Right. But I'm not going to just discount my work. I... I'm, I don't like this whole thing about discounting the work. You know, if they went over here to Nordstrom's and they were looking at a $600 leather jacket, which is easy to find at Nordstrom's, <laughs> if they walk up to the salesperson and say, I can't afford this, would you sell it to me for $300? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, then why are they doing that to you? <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> Why are they doing it to you? They're devaluing the value of what you have and they're asking you to buy into their value, their devaluation. And actually somebody, I can't remember now who said this, it's somebody else I know in the online world. Mm. I wish I could remember it because I want to give it credit. It might have been Lisa Bowles, but I don't think, I don't think it was. But this was back about four or five years ago and somebody was talking about this exact same question that they had a coaching program and it was set up to be structured X and somebody came to them and said, I will pay you the money, but I want you to structure the program Y in a different way. And the person who answered that question said, you know, really what that person do, is doing is they are declining your offer of business and they're making an alternative offer to you. So they're pushing the boundary of the business and the structure that you've set up and they're asking you to accept their reality of your business. And why would you do that? I guess never say never, but for the most part, it would offend me greatly if somebody said to me, well, okay, I want to come for a VIP day. Can I pay you half of what you normally charge? I don't think so whatever they offer into the world, how would they feel if somebody offered them half? I mean, it's not a flea market. My business is not a flea market and neither is yours. You've worked too hard and too long to get there. Yeah. I mean, what do you think? I think you're right. I think you're right. I was just curious what you would say to that. Cause I know you're, you're really good at boundaries on stuff. I, I admire that in you. Ah, uh, well, thanks. Um, I'm, learning <laughs> which is probably why someone would ask me that question yeah i think people can sense it sometimes yeah. um i mean you know i actually had a person who approached me about doing a, a business intensive day with me a full day where they would fly in and we would sit down and spend a day um and she was all excited about it really wanted it really it liked me as a coach had had experience of hearing me speak a couple of times and had a couple of my books and all that 
and, and she was a real go-getter and I was really enthusiastic about working for, with, with her because I like people who are going to implement all those ideas that we come up with during a day and you know they leave with like their first 90 days in a binder like this is what you know this is this is what you're going to implement to come to fruition what you've done here today and we got pretty far down the road of even wanting you know looking at dates and all that kind of stuff and then she she balked over the price of it and she said oh I just could never afford to pay that and I thought okay I really would have loved to work with her but it's her decision she has to see that that is going to be worth it to her and that she can monetize it and when people say that it's a see and if somebody if it was a six hundred dollar program and somebody offered me three hundred or if it was a business intensive day and somebody said oh I could only afford to pay half I'm thinking they're hedging their bets. They know they're really not going to implement what we talk about and they just want to cut their losses early in the game. Because it, if this $600 thing could lead them to $10,000 in sales, then why are they balking? Hmm. A lot of times people who are new to entrepreneurship or who haven't done well over the years don't understand. You have to invest in your business if you want it to pay off. And sometimes that's hard for me to learn. I mean, I've invested thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars in my business, but actually it caught me up like last night we were watching, have you been watching this beach flip uh, program on HGTV where they have these four teams and they're all, they're all rehabbing a beach house down on Orange Beach, a separate beach house, and then they have a competition. So they were down to um, the next to last rooms, which were the bathrooms. There were two bathrooms. And this one couple, this um, two friends from Alabama, both of whom are interior designers, these two women, and they're sharp. I really like them. They're sharp as a tack. They had $15,000 left for the whole rest of the competition. And they went out on the beach and said, we're going to win this. We're going to put $13,000 into these two bathrooms and have two killer showstopper bathrooms and win this because if we do, we win $6,500 and then that will help us for the last room of the house. Otherwise, if we fail, we're only going to have $2,000 or about $1,500 left to renovate the last room. So they like put it all on the line. And I was like, oh my gosh, well, if they lose, they're screwed. I mean, they're going to be out of competition. But they understood it took money to make money. It, they understood that they had to have the wow factor and knock the judges off their feet. And so they put together these two bathrooms and they looked amazing. And everybody else's bathrooms look pretty amazing too. But when it was all said and done, those two chicks won. And they got their $6,500. So now they're good to go for the last room of the competition. And I thought, you know, I always say you have to invest in yourself, and I have done that. I've, I've stepped up and invested heavily in myself. But would I have taken 13 of my 15000 knowing that I had $2,000 left for the whole rest of the competition? I don't know if I'd have done it, but they did, and see, they made it paid off. But what they did was they didn't have a plan B. They were all in to make these huge bathrooms do wonderful. Pop. I mean, they were fabulously beautiful. They didn't hedge it and say, well, let's lose cheap material. I mean, they used marble and they used, you know, I mean, it was really wonderful. So they really went all in. And, and actually, I had somebody talk to me about that the other day. They were like, well, I want to start a nutrition program, but I think I better go take a job as a nutritionist instead of starting my own program. And I'm like, quit hedging your bets. Either commit to building your business or go get a job. Don't hedge your bets. Do you agree or not? Like, there's no plan B. When you go into business, there's not a plan B. Right. Yeah. I've, I've jumped ship and had no plan B before. <laughs> Exactly. And um, I've had it not work too. <laughs> but I've not worked too. Yeah. You know, but, I've, I've crashed and burned when I've done it too, but you know. Yeah. Uh, but you picked yourself up and you figured out what else you were going to go and do. Yeah. Yeah. I can't remember if I told you this. I, okay. My fiance is a cop, right? Yeah. Everywhere he goes, he's got, or not everywhere he goes, but when he's on duty, he wears a bulletproof vest and everything. And all this. Anyway, so one day he made this comment about how brave I am. And I was like, brave? Why, why would I be brave? You're the one out there risking your life. You're the one who would run into a burning building and pull people out or whatever, you know. 
And he's like, yeah, you have to live by your wits every single day. Any money you bring in, you, you have to do it. You have to figure that out. He said, that's brave. I'm not that brave. <laughs> that's what he said. So I thought it was kind of interesting. Yeah. You know, I do agree with him. I agree with him. You are brave. I think it is brave to be an entrepreneur. Yeah. Uh, you know, everybody has their down days and, and on my worst days, I think, you know, it'd be a hell of a lot easier to go find a job somewhere. Oh, yeah. Just show up, do your deal. When you shut the door at the end of the day, you're done. No thinking about it in the middle of the night, but it's not nearly as fun, nor is it as financially rewarding. And it certainly doesn't give you the freedom and the flexibility. And I don't think either one of us, you and I are both, we would probably be horrible employees now, right? <laughs> probably. I'm too spoiled for my freedom. <laughs> I do get really spoiled for the freedom. But I do, you know, if you cannot afford to start a business, then work a job and save 25% of everything you make and build a nest egg so where in a year or two years or three years, you can start your business. Don't start a business and cry poor. First of all, it's unbecoming. And second of all, it doesn't serve you. And you will never be successful if you hedge your bets. It's all in, all in. Well, here's my pet peeve of the day. Do you want to hear my pet peeve? Yeah. <laughs> Bernie's pet peeve. Okay, so somebody posted something to their wall. Like, I think everybody that's my friend on Facebook, they don't, um, they're just stalkers because they don't like anything and they don't comment. And so if you don't want to be my friend, just unfriend me and all this other stuff. And I posted back, I was like, do you realize that Facebook only shows a fraction of your posts to your friends and that this isn't about you. <laughs> I didn't say this isn't about you, but I thought, it, and I, I don't know. I just thought, I don't know. There's something about that poor me victim sort of mentality thing. that just makes me want to, <laughs> I mean, it makes me want to slap people upside the head, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. You know, and then they end up with the posts that people actually post to because nobody wants them to feel bad, you know, and it's sort of that, See, to me, that's gamey. That's like, let me try and see how many people. I know I don't like that either. I probably wouldn't have even said that. I'd have probably just unfriended them and been done. <laughs> you know, I have seen that before. Oh, you do have to understand that you could put out a post every minute on Facebook throughout the day, and all of your friends would not even begin to see even one of your posts it is squeezed down in a lot of ways that you don't even recognize and realize. Yeah. And that's the sad thing. You know, if you really want to make sure that you get every single thing that a person says, you have to go in and hit, hit, get notifications from them. And even then, like I'm on, I have you on get notifications yeah. and, and every now and then late at night, I'll be playing with my phone, kind of watching TV and playing with my phone and, and I'll realize there's three or four things from you that even under get notifications, I didn't see that maybe I want to, like, I remember one of them was when you held up your hand with your ring mm -hmm. and I was like, how did I miss that? I'm on get notifications, you know, and it just slipped by me because you just can't, the stream is so big. You can't keep, you can't keep it all around. You know, you can't hit it every time. So yes. I don't know. It, you're right. It isn't about her. It, 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 it isn't. You're exactly right. And it is that victim mentality. Yeah. So anyway, that's my pet peeve. <laughs> okay. Um, let me see if we have any questions. Right? Yeah, see if we have any questions. I don't see any. Okay. I wonder where Joanne is today. She usually has a question <laughs> for us or two. I know. You, she you never know. Somebody wrote me from... Um, Sweden or somewhere the other day and said, and I haven't heard from them in a long, long time and said, Oh, I just want you to know, I always watch your peep show. Now they may be watching the replay, you know? And I was like, really? I had no idea <laughs> that person ever, ever saw the peep show. And that brings up an interesting point. You know, I've been talking about blog visibility and how to drive traffic to your blog and using visual content to do that. Um, You cannot take it as a measure of your reach, how many comments or even how many shares or likes that you get. 
or how many retweets that you get or how many repins that you get. Yeah. You really have to look at um, the traffic. Like if it's a blog post, you have to look at the traffic to your blog because most people will not take the time to like or share or comment or leave a blog comment or repin a pin. I mean, I'm bad about that. I look at pins I like all the time and I almost never repin them. I just don't have time. I'm just, I'm flipping through there real quick. If, if anything, I probably retweet more than I do anything else because it's click. It's just a qu one quick click and I don't even have to add a comment if I don't want to. So, yeah, I've noticed like with mine, the blog comments just don't happen anymore. You have uh, to look at your traffic and measure your success from your traffic and not from your comments. Yeah. I believe I could comment on the bottom of my blog, leave a comment here and I'll send you a hundred dollar bill. And I swear to God, nobody would comment. <laughs> People just don't anymore. No. Uh -uh. In fact, Michael Hyatt back about three or four or five months ago, who's a big blogger, as you know, Paul Evans follows him. Um, Michael turned off the ability to comment on his blog. And he's a major, very celebrity person. Hmm. He said, it's of no count. It doesn't matter. People aren't, aren't commenting. And, you know, I kind of wondered, well, he used to get four and 500 comments per blog post and now it's down to nothing. Did he, did he not want people to see that it had diminished? But yet his readership was up. And he, he allowed people to still, um, on Facebook, if he posted the blog post, they could still like it or share it, but they couldn't comment it. And you know, I thought about doing the same thing. Was it, what's the purpose in making it where you can't comment though? Is it just cause you don't want spammy stuff in there or something? Yeah, it's like it's not, I, I guess he just said it was, maybe he didn't want to feel like he had to go in and reply to all the comments and you know how it, all that goes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Somebody, somebody told me today about Instagram. You know, you really should be replying to everybody who likes your photo, who comments on your photo. And I'm like, holy cow, people. I have to do that on Facebook already. I can't be doing it on Facebook and Twitter and Pinterest. And like, what am I going to do? Sit here all day and answer social media likes? I mean, I've got to work sometime. <laughs> I can't be doing that. Yeah. So, no. It gets to be too much. Really. I've been doing this blog series. Yeah. Days. And um, interestingly, I've actually gotten people who've private messaged me and said they like it. So that, that's been something different than, you know, like, oh, I'm watching your series. Or they emailed me. They didn't comment. I don't even think they liked. Right. They sent me a message. That, they don't want people to know that that's what they're struggling with. Ah, maybe that's it. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't think about that. If I were writing about erectile dysfunction, <laughs> guys, they're not going to comment. Oh yeah, I understand what you're talking about, but I will get a private message from them. I'll guarantee you. Not that I've ever blogged about that. <laughs> Had no experience. I don't know if you saw my thing on Facebook. This is totally off the topic, but I had to go get an MRI. Um, last week and I and they kept asking me questions do you have this do you have that do you have the other thing no yes no yes and at the bottom the, one of the last questions was okay Mrs. Painter do you have a penile implant <laughs> and I was like um, I think that question is for the opposite sex no don't have one and furthermore never thought about it <laughs> people were laughing on Facebook about it <laughs> Just, it was like cold water in my face. It was not the question I was expecting. I was expecting like, are you pregnant? You know, those kind of questions <laughs> at any rate. But then I started thinking, you know, if I were talking about that, not people would private message me about it. Right. And I was sitting out in this big waiting room and they're asking me all these questions and 14 other people could know, you know, did I have high blood pressure? Did I have a penile implant? Did I have pierced ears? All this stuff that they ask you when you're about ready to have a, have a MRI. So it they didn't, actually asked you in person, like where they knew who you were, it wasn't like a form or something. I don't know. She was standing right there in front of me. She had to go through this form. I mean, we were like, she was like right here, picking them off on the clipboard as, as we were talking. <laughs> I guess today's world, you might have a penile. <laughs> <laughs> But for the record, I don't. Never. <laughs> <laughs> Just for the record. But so getting vulnerable, she does not have a female in front. Right. 
<laughs> That's the headline news. So, but it's like that we were talking about this romance thing that you've been writing about, which is great. People are into that, but they will message you privately if it really touches a deep chord in them. So the people who are responding to you, you know, it's it's really better than a comment. If they take the time to do a private message or a private email, it's better than just a comment on your blog post or on Facebook. You know, somebody that had said they'd been reading my stuff for years and this was the, my best, most vulnerable stuff I'd done. Well, it's because you're normally talking about business topics and not about relationships. Yeah. What did I tell you the other day when we were talking? What did I say? <laughs> Sex sales. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it does. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> It does. Sex and relationships and money. They, that all of that always sells. Yeah, that's true enough. Are we done? I see we're at the half hour mark. I think we are done. We are done. Okay. Everybody will be pleased to know that we already have our next peep show scheduled for next week. And Marnie, probably when you and I um, go. What's the opposite of going live? Going dark, I guess. When we go dark, when we go, when we go dead here in a minute, we probably should schedule out like for the following week. But we do have next week already set up, and I have sent people the link to that already. But we'll do it again when we send out the replay for this. Okay, cool. It's good to talk with you. All right, you too. Okay, bye. Bye.